All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. It's uh, just a little bit before nine, so we'll uh, we won't get started here for just another thirty seconds or something. Uh, but uh, if you are joining us, get your Bibles ready, uh, get your notebook ready. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be uh, talking about Joseph again tonight, and um, and so. Uh, uh, we want to talk about uh, suddenly, <laughs> suddenly in Joseph's life something happens. And uh, again, we've been talking about trusting God in his timing that not everything works out the way that we want it to. Uh, not everything works out in our time frame, but we have to be reminded um, as we was talking about um, uh, last week, uh, 2 Peter 3.8 says, Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. And so, in other words, what Peter was saying is that, look, that God's timing is not our timing. We have to learn to be patient. We have to learn to trust. We have to learn to ask God for what we need, and then and then wait. Wait upon the Lord. Um, you know, the Bible says, those who wait upon the Lord, he'll renew their strength. And so that's a hard lesson to learn is, is to wait, is to be still and wait with confidence that God is going to show up and he's going to answer our prayer. He's going to meet our needs, uh, but he's promised to do that. If you're a believer, God's promised that he'll supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And, and as, a, uh, as a believer uh, myself, I have seen that work out. And I'm going to I'll share with you one of those stories here in a little bit when we uh, get a little further into the Bible study. So, um, so 9 o'clock, 901, welcome again. We we're welcome you here to the Bible study tonight. We are studying out of uh, this day, devotional, No More Excuses, by Dr. Tony Evans. And um, we're, we've been studying the life of Joseph. And now let's just recap just a minute. Joseph was, a, was the youngest of all of his brothers, his father loved him and showed favoritism because uh, Joseph was born to Jacob in old age. Uh, he made him a coat of many colors, and the brothers got jealous. So they wanted to kill him, but they decided, let, Reuben stepped in and said, let's don't kill him. Let's put him in a, in, a, uh, in a hole in the ground here, and when merchants come by, we'll sell him into slavery. And so that's what they done. Uh, they... Um, they uh, they ended up um, uh, selling him into slavery, and they went back and told the father that uh, he was um, that he was dead. And so Joseph now uh, ends up in Potiphar's house. Potiphar, uh, if you remember, uh, give him control of everything. Uh, then his wife accused Joseph of raping her, uh, which was an unfounded claim. Potiphar put Joseph into prison, and this is where we find Joseph uh, as we pick up tonight. Joseph's in prison, uh, <clears throat> so, so here he is in prison uh, for something he didn't do, but he's finding favor in the prison. Uh, God is with him, so everything that, uh, everything that uh, Joseph touches is blessed, and so he, uh, he, keeps, he get, becomes in charge of, that, of the prison, and then there's a dream by the uh, cupbearer and the uh, chief baker. And uh, the cupbearer gets his uh, answer, and he ends the, the answer to the dream was that he was going to be restored. And Joseph told the cupbearer, said, listen, when you get back to Pharaoh, remember me. And that didn't happen. Now, Pharaoh, as we pick up tonight, Pharaoh's had a dream. Um, he has a dream about seven... Uh, seven calves that are lean, seven calves that are, are large, fat. And so nobody can answer the dream. And so all of a sudden, the cupbearer gets his memory back. He, um, he remembers uh, that Joseph answered his dream. And so he tells uh, Pharaoh, he says, go get Joseph and, and he'll tell you what's going on. So they get Joseph out of prison and Joseph tells Pharaoh that, listen, here's what this dream means. The seven fat calves are seven years of plenty for the nation of Egypt. 
you're going to have a, a time of abundance where uh, things are going to go well. You're going to have plenty of rain. The weather, weather's going to be just right. And so uh, behind that seven years, so we're talking about a 14-year span, behind that seven years is seven years of lean. The, uh, the rain's going to shut off. You're going to have famine. You're going to have problems. And so J Joseph's recommendation was in the seven years of plenty, we need to save. We need to put back. You need to harvest all the grain you can, put it in storage, put it back, get it, um, uh, you know, get it ready because times are coming. Uh, during the seven years of lean, we'll use what we've put back to get us through. And so um, Pharaoh said, great, let's do this. And Joseph's advice was that Pharaoh appoint a famine commissioner uh, so Egypt could survive during this, this time. And Pharaoh said, well, that's a great idea. Joseph, you're it. I'm putting you in charge. He says, "I matter of fact, in Genesis 41, uh, 40 through 41, Genesis chapter 41, 40 through 41, he says, let's, let me get my Bible. Let's look at that real quick. Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40 and verse 40. 40, 40. Well, that's not right. 41, 40, sorry. 41, 40. Um, listen to what Pharaoh says to Joseph. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Now let me ask you a question. How often have you ever heard of a prisoner going from being a prisoner in the jail to being uh, the head of everything except the throne? I mean, basically, uh, Pharaoh says, if anybody asks my permission to do something, I'm going to send them to you because you are the number two man in Egypt. Just like that. He was just in prison 30 minutes ago. Now, all of a sudden, he is now the second in charge in Egypt, getting ready for the famine. Now, how does that happen? Well, it happens when God moves on behalf of his people. Joseph learned to be patient. Joseph learned that even though things in life were not fair, and you're going to face those times too, my friend, that you're going to, you're going to deal with life, and life's not going to be fair. There are going to be people who are going to be more successful than you. There's going to get, be people who get paid more than you. There's going to be people who get ahead when you've worked your tail off to, to advance on your job. There's going to be people that's going to get ahead of you, and they've barely done anything. You're going to have times when, uh, you know, People come against you, they call you names, they talk about you, they do all kinds of things, and all you're trying to do is what's right, right? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to live a good life, a good godly life that points others to Jesus, and we're trying to do the right things. And sometimes bad things happen. You know, that's part, in my estimation, that's part of living here when when. Adam fell in the garden. That's what he ushered in, sin and, and all these problems. And we're not going to ever escape them until we get out of here. And then uh, when we get out of here, we'll, we'll live in eternity where the, we won't have any of these problems. So here comes uh, Joseph. He's now in 30 minutes time. His life has changed upside down. Uh, he's left in prison after the cupbearer from last week. We talked about the cupbearer. Forgot him. He's left in there for two more years. He's left in prison. A and you have to believe that Joseph wondered why, but he made a decision that he was going to do a couple things in his life. And you can see this in the life of Joseph. He decided, number one, that he was going to have integrity. He was going to have integrity. He was going to do what's right regardless of the cost. And folks, if there's one thing our world needs now is integrity. It needs men, you know, it, women too, but it, you know, I'm a man speaking to men. It needs men of integrity, men who say what they mean and mean what they say, men who when you shake their hand, a handshake is as good as a, a contract, that when somebody tells you that they're, that they're going to do something, their word is good as gold. And so Joseph had integrity. He made the decision 
uh, that he was going to do the right thing regardless of what happened to him. Now, the other thing that Joseph had, I think, is uh, Joseph had patience. Joseph had patience, and he realized that things, uh, that the mess that he was in, he didn't cause. I mean, it wasn't his fault that he was the youngest brother. It wasn't his fault that the father loved him because he was the youngest brother. It wasn't his fault that the father made him a coat of many colors. None of this was his fault. But he was decided he was going to be a patient man, that he was going to trust God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. That's my life verse, has been my life verse since I've been a Christian. And I've found that it to be true, that when we trust God with all of our heart, he takes care of us. And I can tell you, he's taking care of this old boy. Joseph's life was where he was a slave and going nowhere. It looked hopeless from our perspective. He's a, he's a slave, going nowhere, and now he's rotten in jail. And then within 30 minutes, he becomes the number two ruler in the most powerful nation in the world at that time. Now, how'd that happen? God. It's the only thing you can, you can attribute to. A higher power. God. God showed up. Michael, I, I, I uh, see here you, uh, you don't believe in God. I, I hope you'll reconsider that. Think, think through that. I'm here for you to talk with you if you want to talk about it. How'd you get here? Three questions. How'd you get here? What are you doing here? And how do you plan to get out of here? That's something to think about. And, and as you grow, and, and t- uh, you're a young man right now, and as you grow, uh, keep, que- keep asking, keep searching, keep learning. And I I appreciate you being here uh, with us. Uh, But God showed up. God showed up. Let me tell you how that works. How do I know that that will happen? Let me tell you. In 2004, some of you all have heard this story, but some of you may not. In 2004, I had my first back surgery. And uh, I was off work from the university for six months. And I didn't get any better. As a matter of fact, I went from bad to worse after I had surgery. And so there I was in 2004. Shandy was uh, three, uh, just a little bit, just, eh, just a little bit two. She just had, had turned two in December the year before. There I was with a two-year-old, a brand new house. Um, what are we going to do? Couldn't go back to work because the doctor told me that I couldn't go back to work. Now, here was the, the place he put me in, right? The doctor did. Couldn't go back to work, but he wouldn't disable me. And so I remember my question to him, what am I supposed to do here? And he looked at me and he slammed my folder down on the table and he said, I don't care what, what's that got to do with me? You figure that out. And so there I was in a hopeless situation. I had to go and I had to voluntarily quit from the university so that I could get on my wife's insurance. uh, So this would not be pre-existing my back. And uh, back in those days, that was before they changed the law. uh, You had, you know, where you, uh, pre-existing had to be covered pre-existing wasn't covered then so i had 30 days to get on her insurance so i had to quit i had to get on her insurance so that i wouldn't be pre-existing and never be able to be covered for this and so i get a call out of the blue one day from a man that i didn't even know knew who i was he was um, uh, upper management i've been around him a few times but not enough for me to be of anything on his mind And evidently, he'd been inquiring why I quit. And so they called me from work and said, we need you to call Bill. And so I called Bill up. And, uh, you know, like I say, I didn't know him that well. He didn't know me. And he said, I want to tell me what happened to you. And I told him my story. I said, basically, I've had surgery. I'm not any better. I'm worse. And the doctor won't let me come back to work. And he said on the phone, he said to me, he said, in a real deep voice, he said, son, do you want a job? I said, oh, yeah, Mr. Reeser, i got to have a job. i, I got to do something. Um, you know, I've got a brand-new baby and a new house, and, you know, I'm, I was 27 years old at the time. I said, um, I've got to do something. And uh, I said, but the thing is, I can't walk. I'm in bad shape. I can, I, I can walk a little bit, and then I have to sit down. 
And so I don't care about that. You want a job, you got it. And um, so he gave me a job, and I, could, I couldn't even walk. And so he gave me a job with a, with a man who uh, uh, was friends. Him, him and I were friends, and he showed me favor by giving me a job, putting me at a desk, ordering parts for his maintenance group. And, um, you know, here I am all these years later, um, you know, I'll be, at the, I'll be um, com 26 years at the university in January. And so I tell that story because I ran into Reeser uh, Christmas one year. And I, I run him down in Walmart to thank him for what he'd done. And he said something. Uh, when I think I said, Mr. Reeser, I just want, I just, I told him who, I said, my name's Kevin Strasbaugh, and he said, I know who you are, and I, I said, well, I just want to thank you for what you've done for my family. I said, you've saved our family from bankruptcy and, and whatever, and he made a statement that let me know how I got back full time. He made the statement, he looked me down, and he said, I didn't have a choice, and he turned around and walked off. Now hold it, you got a choice. You're the main guy. But what he was telling me in his own way was that God had spoke to him and told him, you take him back. And just like that, I went from, we were going to lose everything that we had. I went from that to now we're, we're moving forward. Even though I can't physically walk, I can't physically do climb ladders, do maintenance stuff, he, he just made a way, and that's God. God shows up, and he, and he blesses his people, and he meets their needs. And uh, if you don't believe God can do things like that, then you need, to, you need to trust God. You need to ask God to show up in an area in your life that you don't have any absolute resolution to. That there's no way that you're going to win in this one unless he shows up, and he did. He showed up, and, uh, you know, I went back to work and have been back to work, you know, ever since. Now, the other part of that was I went back, but I went back as a temporary employee. So I lost all my benefits. I lost all my retirement. I lost all those things. But I had a job so I could make the bills, right? And so come COVID, the university lays off 1,700 people. And when I, I, I get a text message from my boss and says, when you get here, I need to see you. And I said, uh-oh, I know what's coming down the pike. I know what's getting ready to happen. And so I walked in the office and I said, well, go ahead. I already know what you're going to tell me. He said, well, it's not what you really think. He said, uh, the university is doing away with your position. He said, but here's the deal. you got to make your decision. you got to make it today. You either come back full time or you go to the house. Now, this was just this last year. And I'm like, man, I can't go to the house just yet. I still got bills to pay, trying to pay Shandy's college with cash. Travis is not finished with high school yet. I got to stay around a little while longer. And I said, well, I guess I'm going to have to stay. Now, here's the kicker, folks. <laughs> it was either stay or go home. Now, they're laying off people. But when they, when they, I said, what's my position going to be? And he laid a piece of paper in front of me. And when I got it, my pay increased significantly. My position level went up. Um, I'm like blown away. In the midst of everybody being laid off and all the things that are going on, I'm being prospered. I'm given the opportunity to go back full time and get all my benefits back and all those things. That's, that's what God does for his people. He, he, he blesses them. Now, you might be one of those people that got laid off and said, well, that God didn't do that for me. Well, you might not need it to be there any longer. I'm still needed to be there for some reason. But maybe God lets you get laid off or let you uh, lose your job because he's got other doors he's beginning to, to get ready to open. The thing you've got to understand is this, is that God doesn't work in the ways that we, we would work. God doesn't do the things that he thought we, that we think that he would do. Sometimes he closes doors to open others. Sometimes he closes, and I've often told you about, I had no, I had no intentions of uh, leaving Macedonia. None. I was as happy as a pig in a slop. <laughs> I thought I would retire from there. 
But God closed that door down. I know that now. I didn't know it at the time. I was aggravated at the time the way it ended up. I didn't want it to end that way. Thirteen, I was 13 years there, and I had too good a time to end on a bad note. And that bothers me to this day that it ended the way that it did. But God closed the door. And when I said, okay, I'm, I'm taking me a break. I'm going to take a year off. God said, no, you're not. I got other work for you to do. Go over here. Well, God, I don't want to go over there. Care what you want. Go. God has opened doors and led me. Uh, you know, I, I've been blessed there. You know, to be blessed to know some of you, some, many of you all that are watching this right now, uh, I would have not known you had I not made this move. And so sometimes God shuts down things and opens up other doors. We have to trust him when we walk to walk through those doors. We have to trust him that he knows what's best, that he knows what he's doing. And Joseph did that. Joseph trusted God in every circumstance he faced. He didn't get mad. He didn't go over in the corner and pout. He didn't quit. He kept trusting God. He kept believing, I'm going to be a man of integrity, a man of faith, I'm going to trust God, you know, and even if, I believe Joseph would, would have been this way, even if he never got out of prison, he would have still been successful where he was at because he was a man of integrity. I've met a few men like that. I don't know if you have or not. Men who are, are just godly men who, who uh, are integrity. You know, so, you know. I think about Billy Ray Barnett's one of the guys I, that comes to my mind. Uh, you know that they're not a better fella in the world than that guy, and um, you know, you can trust him. What he he tell you the truth. Uh, you know, I've got a friend that's been a, my friend for a long time, old Jeff Blackburn, and uh, Fro and I. We uh, I call him his. You know, people call him Jeff Fro. I call him Fro. Fro, uh, you know. We just tell it like it is. You know, we don't pull no punches, but we're best of friends. Why? Because I know he's got my, my intentions, my best intentions in mind. And if he has the permission in my life, he has the permission to tell me if I'm being a knucklehead. Uh, you know, I got a friend, Bill Bells, that, that I have, he's got the permission. If I'm doing something stupid, if I'm going the wrong direction, he's got the, the permission to call me out and say, hey, you're being stupid. Now, I don't give that permission to everybody, but it's people that I trust that has integrity, that, that are, has faith, that they're men of God, that, that I trust that have permission to keep me in check. And then just like that, Joseph becomes the number two ruler in all of Egypt. Nobody, again, nobody can do that but God. And you might be sitting here tonight listening to this Bible study facing an impossible situation it may look like by human eyes that this thing ain't gonna work out i want to encourage you tonight to renew your relationship with christ to really get back on track COVID's throwed us all off i mean let's be honest we all have gotten thrown off we're not regular our church attendance for the last year has been you know, virtually online and, and, you know, maybe you've been sitting out in the grass of your church or sitting in the car listening on the radio. Uh, you know, we're just now starting to move back inside and get back to some sort of normal. So we've got to build that routine back. Get back in that routine of going to church and listening to God and listening for God. We've got to get back in the routine of, of uh, reading our Bibles and spending time in prayer. But we've got to practice patience and we gotta we gotta pray god i've got this need and i know you can handle it but i don't see a way right now i'm relinquishing it to you make it work out somehow and then we walk away from it now what i do afterwards is i don't ever i don't go back and revisit that except to go back and say when i'm praying lord thank you that you heard my prayer thank you that the answer is on the way Thank you that you're going to make it all work out. Lord, you know the need I got. I've done talk to you about it. Thank you that you're making it making a way. It looked like Joseph was going to spend the rest of his life in prison. And it may look like the rest of your life's not going to be any better. 
It looked like for me with my back that it wouldn't be any better. But a friend of mine that, that, that I had from high school and hadn't talked to a whole lot, but uh, reached out to me and said, uh, you know, we've got this doctor at our hospital. Why don't you come and see him? I believe he can help you. And it was, it was at the point where I was ready to, I was going to do one or two things. I was either going to get better or I was going to quit. I didn't made up my mind. If this doesn't work, I'm filing disability, I'm done. I can't go any further in this much pain. And this doctor stuck this box in my back, and now 98% of the pain is gone. Now, do I still have some problems? Yeah, my knees are bothering me. I've got some knee problems, and uh, you know, but 98% of the pain, 95% of the pain is gone. And there didn't seem to be a way for that. But I hadn't met the right person. You may be one connection away, one meeting away, one person away from God answering your prayer. But most people quit before they get to that point. Joseph had made up his mind that if I have to stay here, I'm going to do, I'm going to stay in prison and I'm going to do the right thing. And I have made up my mind that I'm going to be a Christian. That I'm going to serve Jesus as best as I can. Not always going to do it right. But you know what? God's proven too much to me for me to turn back now. God's answered too many prayers for me to give up and quit. God has showed me too many things for me to to not uh, go to church and, and not serve him. Nah. What's the lesson we can get out of this tonight? God knows, here it is, God knows where he's taking you. He knows. Write that down somewhere. God knows where he's taking me. He knows. And the second part of that is he knows the lessons I need to learn in order to be equipped when I get there. Two things. Write them down. God knows where he's taking me. And he knows the lessons that I need to learn in order to be equipped when I get there. My first pastorate was difficult. Now, now let me let me say this. I love the people, love the people, still love them, still friends. We drive, we go down every now and then, and, and we see them and talk to them on Facebook. Love those folks, great people. But I had a man in there that was, it was his mission to make my life hell. And the reason why he wanted to make my life hell was that his life, he wasn't happy with his life. And that's generally the way it works, right? When you got people that are unhappy with, with themselves, they want you to be unhappy. But I was a first-time pastor, and I had never, you know, I was a young man. I was in my early 20s. I never dealt with anything like this. And, you know, I didn't know how to handle things. And I ended up walking away from there for uh, after about a year or so. Uh, biggest regret of all my ministry was that I walked away from there, and I didn't have permission to leave. God didn't tell me to leave. But I, somebody told me one day, he said, the, he said, the reason you went through that was to prepare you for your next assignments. And, and I've looked back now, you know, that, that was, um, you know, 20 some years ago. And I look back now and I realize when I run into problems, I'm like, oh, I've seen that before. I've dealt with that before. I know what that, let me deal with it different this time around than I did that time. That's why I don't ever, hardly ever get upset, hardly ever lose my cool. Um, you know, I don't argue with folks, you know, church folk, I'm not arguing with you. Uh, we don't have no business fighting. We're together for an hour uh, a week. We're getting ready to be two with Sunday school starting back this Sunday. That's not enough time to argue about anything. There's nothing to argue about with two out being together two hours a week. But those experiences prepared me for future things and for stuff I'm I'm dealing with now. 
And so all the negative stuff you go through, if you keep going through it, it's a preparer for the things that you're, that, uh, you're going to deal with later. God's equipping you. You're learning lessons through the difficult days. You're learning lessons through the challenges you're facing. It's easy to take challenges and throw up our hands and quit. But, but the better thing, if you're facing something tonight, take a minute and stop and say, okay, God, what are you trying to teach me in this? What are you trying to show me? What area do I need to grow in? What is it about my life that you're trying to get through to me about something? Will you hear God shout at you? No. But in the stillest of small voices, God speak to your spirit. And it might jump out of you when you're reading your devotional. It might jump out at you when you're reading scripture. Or one day it just may make sense. Ah, that's what you were preparing me for. That's what you were getting me ready for. And so God knows the lessons we need to learn in order to equip us to get there. Let me ask you a question. Now, what obstacles keep you from believing that God can change your circumstances? What obstacles keep you from believing that God can change your circumstances? What obstacles? That you haven't seen your children get saved and you've been praying for them? That's an obstacle. Finances, health, job, relationships. Psalms 20 verse 7 says, Some, takes pride, some take pride in chariots and others in horses. But we, believers, take pride in the name of the Lord our God. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's ever a time to proclaim your faith in Jesus, it's now. If there was ever a time for us as believers to stand up and say so, I'm a believer. I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed to tell you that I love a man named Jesus. I'm serving him with all of my heart. I'm not ashamed to tell you I go to church. I'm not ashamed to tell you that I pray when I eat. I'm not ashamed. What have I got to be ashamed of? I'm not doing anybody no harm. I'm living a good life. I'm treating my... Uh, uh, Phil Robinson, I don't know if y'all uh, know Phil Robinson. Phil Robinson is... Uh, is the dad on uh, Duck Dynasty. He's the patriarch of the Robinson family, and he's the man. He was a, a great football player. Matter of fact, if you know anything about football, you know Terry Bradshaw is a Hall of Famer who uh, won five Super Bowls with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Terry Bradshaw only got to play in college because Phil Robinson decided to go duck hunting and quit football. Phil Robinson was an NFL caliber quarterback. And we may not have ever heard of, uh, oh boy, had Phil not kept playing football. But Phil Robinson says this uh, about me. How hard is it, he says, to love God and love your neighbor? That's about all God. That's what God is asking us to do. Love him, love our neighbor. How hard is that really? It's not too hard, I don't think. Now you say, well, yeah, but you know there's some people. Listen, I didn't say everybody that you come across, you got to like them. There's some people that I just don't like being around. There's some people that they're too loud, they're too obnoxious, they cuss too much, they, they uh, holler too much, they, they, uh, you know, they, they don't believe in God, they don't lift up the name of God, they don't, you know. So there's a lot of people in life that, that I don't like being around. But doesn't mean don't love them. You, you as a believer, we've got to love everybody. And so he says, how hard is it to love God and love your neighbor? And that's all God's asking us to do. And trust him. Trust him that everything's going to work out. Now, folks, it's been about 30 minutes, so we're going to wrap this this one up here tonight and get ready for next week's listen i want you to understand that, that god does things not in our time frame he does it in his own and you may be in the waiting holding pattern right now you're waiting for god to show up you're waiting for an answer you're waiting for god to to to, to meet your need 
in the midst of the waiting pattern, you seek God. Get in this Bible. Get in this Bible. Spend some time. Now, I want to tell you a couple things about getting in this Bible. One, get you a Bible that you understand. I use the NIV Bible, the New International Version of the Bible. If you buy it from LifeWay.com, you'll get a good Bible. Now, I don't buy... I don't buy my Bibles from anywhere but LifeWay.com because I know I can trust them to be good versions, uh, translations. And I use a New International Version from LifeWay. You can use the New American Standard. Uh, it's a good one. Um, but you get you a version that you can understand and you begin to read it. If you, you're not sure about reading the Bible, read a proverb a day. Go through the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. If you can find the book of Psalms, it's the next book over. Psalms, the big book. Proverbs is the next book over 31 of them. Read one a day. I mean, you know, listen, that's where I get this. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he'll make your path straight. Now look, look at this wisdom here. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. And he says, when I do that, don't be wise in my own eyes. Fear the Lord, shun evil. Now listen to what he says. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. I give. I'm a giver. I believe in giving to God financially. And look at what it says in verse 9 of Proverbs 3. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then, here's the promise connected to it, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Give, and it shall be given. You cannot give God. But read a proverb a day. You don't know much about Jesus, fleet trucker gaming. You don't, if you don't know much about Jesus, read the book of John. Read the book of John in the New Testament. It tells the story of Jesus, about all the things that he'd done when he was here. And John ends up his book saying, if, if you go to the book of John, and you look at the, um, at the very last thing John writes... Very last thing John writes in chapter 21, John says this Jesus did many other things as well. Even everyone, if, okay, if every one of them were written down, this is what John says if everything Jesus done was written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have a room for the books that would be written. Oh, that's great stuff. Great stuff. Get in there and, and get in your Bible. Proverbs and John. Spend a little time in there. And wait on God. When you're praying, thank God that he's got the answer, that the answer's on the way. Thank you, Lord. Joseph surely done that in prison. Thank you, Lord. You got the answer. And so when he got delivered in a 30-minute in a, in a span, he gets delivered. Do you think he was surprised, Joseph? that he got put to number two in all of Egypt. He wasn't surprised. He knew his God was going to show up and work. He knew his God was going to meet his needs. That's the kind of man he was. He had faith. He trusted God. And may that be the same said of us, that we are people of faith who trust God, who love God and love our neighbors. We're not raising ruckus. We're not trying to cause trouble. We're just loving God and loving people and believing with all of our hearts. I don't know about you, but God's good. Give me a, give me a, a heart if you think God's good because God is good. Can't outgive God. Can't outwork Him. Can't outdo Him. Can't outshine Him. God is good. And we need to serve Him every day with everything we've got. God. So, Joseph gets out of prison, and we'll pick up next week. Um, we still got a little problem. What about dad and the brothers? We'll pick up and talk about how God restores things next week. Hey, friends, we love you. So thankful God's brought, brought you into my path, and I hope that, that I have blessed you as much as you bless me. 
Uh, if you've got a blessing out of this night, share this with others. If you're just now joining us, as soon as I hit the finish button, you can go back and watch the beginning of it. Uh, we're about 38 minutes in, so if you just got here with us, uh, you missed about 30 minutes, but you can catch back up on that. Uh, share it with your friend. Get it out there. Other people need to hear the gospel. They need to hear hope. They need to hear somebody who's got hope, who's experienced the hand of God moving in their life. You can't outgive God. You can't outwork God, but you can trust God. Believe in Him and know that He is a miracle-working God. When, the, when things look down, when times look tough, when it looks like there's no way that you're going to come out to the good, you trust God. Turn it over to Him and watch Him make a way where there seemed to be no way. I love you. I'll catch you next time.